This is Twit. Uh, a big theme in JD's book, as he already mentioned, is how you um, gather together a bunch of DNA that you could put to other useful and marketable purposes. And uh, one way that is pursued in your book, JD, is to go uh, retrieve it from places where DNA has been left in the ground or uh, in a tomb. Yeah, tell us about the legal research you did on that and what you learned. Well, I relied on experts like you, Denise, <laughs> to sort of uh, steer me in the right direction. Um, I was sort of coming at it uh, cold, um, trying to figure out, okay, you know, there are a lot of different categories here. You've got uh, living, uh, you know, like Hollywood celebrities who are living, leaving their uh, DNA behind in different places. Can you legally uh, uh, take advantage of that? Um, there are uh, the recently deceased, uh, so people, uh, celebrities, even like Marilyn Monroe or, or Frank Sinatra, they've actually got uh, talent agencies that uh, survive long after their deaths, and they're still uh, licensing their their um, their likenesses today, but they are not likely to license their DNA. And then you have the long dead. Uh, uh, legends like Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo, um, people who have been interred hundreds of years ago. And there's actually an interesting kind of legal question uh, for the lawyers out there of, you know, who owns the remains of Leonardo da Vinci today? Is it uh, the Church of... Uh, uh, the church where he's buried, um, is it his ancestors, uh, 450 years removed, um, somebody else, you know. Um, so the, the question is, um, what happens, you know, besides from the, the, the criminal point of view, if you send a, a team of grave robbers, and I've got my grave team operator shirt on here, um, <laughs> if you send a grave of operate team of <coughs> grave team operators out there to dig up Leonardo's body, uh, after the the criminal statute of limitations passes, and the only question is whether you have the legal right to uh, clone uh, Leonardo's remains and and clone it for a particular set of a variety of different traits, um, whether you'd be allowed to do that or not. And I think it's actually kind of an open question of of you know who's going to stop you from doing that, the states or some somebody who's going to have actually standing to stop you from from uh, from cloning Leonardo. So um, I don't know, probably uh, some attorney out there listening to this would have a better idea than I, but from a, from a fictitious point of view, it's just kind of an interesting to go out there and decide you want to dig up the remains of the most famous legends in history and then let the chips fall where they may after that. Right. One of the fascinating parts about your exploration of those issues to me was the fact that you know, laws that we have around grave robbing never anticipated these kinds of concerns. <laughs> the the exactly. penalties, there, there could be penalties for um, removing someone's remains, stealing someone's remains, and generally they are, but they're not very severe. And they're not looking toward this kind of uh, situation. What were you going to say, Glenn? Oh, I was. I just think it's fascinating as well. I think the idea that you know we are contained in our DNA um, mm -hmm. is is one that you know for a while seemed kind of silly and fanciful to people in genetics because of course you know we've always made this distinction between you know the the erector set we're made out of and then the, what we do with it. But the truth is that so much of what happens to us becomes uh, a part of our DNA. So we have all the DNA we inherited, and then we go through our lives and the you know the moles and age spots and, you know, all these things that, that again, at 50, I'm ever more aware of uh, the traumas <laughs> we encounter, you know, they're very real and measurable and they also imprint in our cells. So the DNA of a person, I mean, I don't believe for a minute that someone who goes and takes the DNA from a crypt is going to get a copy of that person uh, in, in, in a total or real sense. But I am more and more convinced that the thing they get would be scary and might very well be the sort of thing that the dead person would have had an interest in preventing. And, <laughs> you know, our law is pretty bad uh, when it comes to dealing with dead people because, of course, you know, dead people can't have rights and you got property based law, uh, a constitution that really definitely did not envision dead people having interests. So, you know, we just don't have the sort of legal spectacles to 
think about uh, those interests of the you know person who's been dead five minutes or 500 years. And so we're not going to do a very good job of it. And I think J.D. is pointing us in the right direction. We have to be more mindful, frankly, of – what it is that we could reasonably foresee in the future that we wouldn't want to have happen to us. I mean, you know, honestly, our whole lives are about that now, right? We, uh, you know, every time you pick up your your, your smartphone, uh, it's asking you to give permission. And you know, the recent years and recent events have focused so much attention on how many bits of permission we're giving and how all-encompassing they are so that we leave artifacts all over the internet, all over society and our friends and our lives, uh, data about us we don't even begin to understand. Once you sort of collect all that data, the you know, the, the data that is the footprint of our lives, piece it together, add it to the DNA that you've got, you know, that you've left behind in the crypt, how far really are we from constructing a biological facsimile of a person who's actually alive now maybe 200 years 300 years i don't know or maybe it could happen uh, uh in the next hundred if you're looking for an example of of a current grappling with what what can be done with uh the dna from ancient remains well we know and we have in our discussion points for to, from today we've already discussed uh trying to bring back the woolly mammoth others are trying to bring back the dodo uh, some archaeologists just want to study uh, the DNA of people who lived hundreds of years ago. And there's a controversy or at least a discussion about um, whether a tiny mummified body that was found in Chile, uh, whether there were any restrictions um, to studying its DNA. And uh, the journal Genome Research uh, which published an analysis of that DNA, decided that uh, the mummy was merely a specimen, did not require special ethical consideration, did not legally qualify as a human subject because she is not living. So if you know we're going to take into account that there might be things that could be done with DNA other than simply studying how people lived hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, uh, we, we might want to rethink how we... Um, regulate and enact laws about that. The other thing uh, that we've mentioned, the other way you can abandon DNA is not merely by dying, but by going to a restaurant and drinking a glass of water and uh, wondering whether your your cleanup team is going to prevent someone from <laughs> taking that glass. I think it's kind of charming that there's a piece in Bon Appetit magazine uh, discussing the murky legal world of the DNA you leave behind in restaurants, uh, et cetera. We, we know that abandoned DNA uh, is out there in the world everywhere, and we know that it's being used. We now know specifically, and we talked about this a few weeks ago on the show, that uh, part of the way that they caught the Golden State Killer and various other serial killers throughout the years, but specifically we now have prosecu uh, prosecutorial confirmation from the Golden State Killer case that um, uh, abandoned tissues were used to um, uh, collect DNA that the investigators needed to tie together all the loose ends in those cases. So. Uh, this whole notion of, of the DNA that we leave around us is, is going to become more and more important and we're going to need to think about, you know, if you're out in public leaving things, is it like being in public uh, for the purposes of a photograph? We have special laws that protect celebrities in that kind of case, right, of publicity laws that have come in and sort of trumped this overarching privacy framework that we have that says, hey, if you're in public, you're fair game. Uh, I would yeah. think that we we would see a similar kind of legal process develop uh, as we go forward into these brave new worlds of DNA usages where um, uh, right of publicity laws don't only protect celebrities. They protect you from being uh, exploited for commercial purposes uh, without your permission. And I would think that abandoned DNA laws might might start to look the same way. But right now we have nothing uh, as far as I understand it. Glenn, is that your understanding as well? 
Uh, uh, well, we have mostly nothing. What we have are mm-hmm. a bunch of cases where uh, the courts have tried to figure out how to treat genetic material and more importantly for the purposes of something like the Golden State Killer uh, to figure out whether or not there's entrapment involved, whether the materials were legally obtained. I think in that case they they induced someone to spit in a tube and I, I don't remember the whole story. But, but honestly, the question about how you come to leave your DNA is one that is a part of a – just a mess of bioethics mm-hmm. stuff around genes. We, we, for a long time, allowed companies to patent DNA that they discovered. Uh, so mm-hmm. BRCA1, the breast cancer gene, was owned by Myriad Genetics for years until the Supreme Court flipped flip that one. Um, but you know, it, and then, you know, we, many have heard the story of Henrietta Lacks. So this is a, you know, a movie was made by Oprah, no less after a book by Rebecca. Um, and it, frankly, that, that story, um, took the opposite position that, um, it was the DNA of a particular person who left some genetic material behind at Johns Hopkins that was responsible for the discovery. And so it should be credited there, uh, at least according to the, 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 the position that was taken in the book. People are all over the place. ACLU doesn't know where it stands. You know, if you ask any given attorney, the position they take on genetic material is going to generally be determined by what they're arguing for uh, at any given particular moment. There isn't really a constituency on this. And so like, yeah, we all sort of feel like that we should own or at least be able to control most of the stuff we leave behind to some degree if you ask it that way. But mm-hmm. if, if it's flipped – so that, you know, the stuff that you leave behind could actually implicate you in hurting people in some way, like secondhand smoke does, uh, then everybody wants to disavow their DNA. So we're going to have to create an entirely new way of thinking about this stuff that comes off of and out of our bodies um, within the next five to ten years for a variety of reasons. I don't think one of the main ones is cloning people. But I do think definitely that the privacy implications of the fact that you can now just take a you know scientific vacuum cleaner and figure out who did what where, they're massive. 